positive feedback loop. Welcome to Positive Feedback Loop. This is the show that gives you awesome life lessons that you can use anywhere and anytime. With myself, Luis, and my co-host, Stephanie. Hello, everyone. Unfortunately, Ray is not with us at this moment. We suspect he may be time traveling. That's which right. just so happens to be the topic of today. <laughs> Wait, what's that? Whoa, whoa, guys, hold on a second. What is going on over here? I was busy... In, in the, the future. future, working on something else, and I came back to listen to the podcast that you guys recorded without me, and I just want to say it was it was a terrible episode. I don't know what you were thinking, and today, we're here to fix it. We are uh, here to talk about true time travel as we define it, one second per second, moving into the future, something we like to call aging. Oh, what? I, I Okay, well, we haven't finished yet. Uh, in fact, we just started recording. Two questions, how, why, and actually also, who, I, what? I'm sorry, that was a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, all right, so guess we're talking L- about Let me now. make it very clear to you. I listened to the podcast that you guys think you were recording today, but it was in the future, and I listened to the po- that podcast, and it wasn't good. I think we should never record it. That's why I'm coming back from the future to stop you from doing it, and we're recording about something better something more interesting and it's going to be about aging and how we perceive time throughout our lives and how the aging process is one inevitable two we actually stop perceiving that process it becomes just a domain of time that we naturally go through but it's not something we sit uh, sit down and really think about is it no one thinks they're time traveling right now but isn't that what we're doing yeah, I guess we're all technically going through that dimension at a slice of time per time. I mean, no time increment really exists in like the fabric of the universe. It's all some something that humans created to measure things arbitrarily. I actually do have experience in the healthcare, particularly aging industry. So working with older adults, seeing what their lives are like and helping them find what they need um, and just making sure that they're they're living good lives and by good i mean just better right than all the alternative a lot of the time um people tend to be pretty scared of aging and i don't think they need to be so steph what do you think uh do you think most people are scared about aging is it the aging process that they're afraid of or is it just really dying i think people are afraid afraid of aging i think they're afraid of what they'll look like, act like, think like, their abilities. I think people are also so afraid of aging that they're afraid of aged people or they treat them differently. When I was in elementary school, we were supposed to do a project on discrimination and we'd have to, we had to pick a group of people that experienced a lot of discrimination. And most of my classmates chose uh, racism, for example, or sexism, and I chose ageism. I was the only one in the class that thought to choose ageism because mm-hmm. it's kind of this hidden discrimination that doesn't get a lot of attention, but it's a really severe problem in our society. It's different from racism in the sense that if you aren't black, you will never be black. But with ageism, you're actually discriminating a type of person that you will be no matter what in the future. You just hit on probably one of the biggest things that I have when it comes to the way people think about older adults. I am so frustrated when people don't realize that barring terrible accidents and self-harm, you will be that person one day. You will be an older adult. Whether you make it to be 90, 150, 115, not 150 because no one lives that long, at least until technology gets there, 115 or you live to be 75, at some point you're going to be an older adult. And you would not want to be treated the way that many people treat older adults. And that is by infantilizing them, taking away... Wait, can you define define that word again really really quick? Infantilizing? As in treating them like they're children, which I see a lot. Infantilizing them. Okay. Yeah. People treat older adults 
like they are children, or as if they're invisible. We strip them of their independence, which everyone does this to a degree, right? You see an older adult trying to do something and you try to help them. I mean, that's very nice and it's a very kind gesture for them for the most part. But a lot of the time, if the older adult can do it themselves, you should let them do it themselves. Every time you see someone go out of their way to help an older adult who is capable of doing the thing that they're trying to do themselves, while it is kind of people to try to help, oftentimes it just pushes in that point that you can't do things on your own. Other people have to help you. And that is a very frustrating feeling for a lot of older adults when they still feel capable of doing things. And for the most part, older adults are very happy. It's not a thing to fear. It's something that looks kind of scary from the outside because the loss of mobility. There's a great song, actually, uh, that this reminds me of by Tom Lear, the guy that did the Table of Elements song. He did a lot of satirical songs, and it's called um, uh, Old and Gray, I think, where it's all about this guy talking about how he's with his wife uh, or with his girl, and he's really excited to be with her, but only for now. When she gets old and fat and gray and, you know, starts being able to move, he doesn't really want any part of that. So he's not, he doesn't want to stick around long term. And this is all the sort of fears that we have kind of about ourselves and others when well, it comes to aging. It's definitely a fear that women have. Men, when they get older, are kind of seen as the Richard Gears of the world. You know, they get more and more hot. And then you have women, they age, and the world is like, oh, you're ugly and old. We don't want you around anymore. And that's kind of, I, whether or not that's true, I think a lot of women perceive their aging that way. And so women are come across as more terrified of it. Yeah, I would agree. I think even in pop culture, you see that it's more difficult for women to deal with aging you know you have this idea of a cougar but it's not as attractive as the idea of having an older gentleman who's you know got these nice gray locks some a lot of respect in his industry or whatnot so that seems to be more um for something for people to look for although i i, I don't know um there's always i, I do agree that it, the world places a lot more emphasis on women's appearances. Looks. Yeah, yeah, appearances when it comes to providing like their internal value, right? When society looks at the value of a woman, their looks play a much heavier part. But there's always cases like Helen Mirren. I mean, she's aged as they say gracefully. I mean, that's that's a standard as well. But yeah, I will agree. Men generally have much easier, a much easier time when it comes to aging because we can look distinguished. It may be like a, a cultural difference across the globe. In the United States, aging, it's more difficult to age. You get infantilized once you age, probably more likely to be infantilized. Whereas in other cultures, if you do age, you are more respected in some way or you're given more honors. And I think of in Japanese culture... Now, I don't know much about Japanese culture, so I'm going off of interesting little tidbits I picked up from watching Terrace House on Netflix. But uh, Terrace House is a Japanese TV reality TV show, and it's so interesting to watch. These are like people in their late teens, early 20s, sometimes even 30s, or maybe late 20s, early 30s. And when they get into the house, when a new person arrives, they're all living in a house together, basically. They're all you know, strangers, they live together. That's the premise of the show. When a new person arrives, one of the first things they do is introduce themselves with their age. And if they don't, every member of the house says, so how old are you? And then whoever has the oldest age is basically seen as the patriarch or matriarch of the house. And they're treated as such. And so you often see the oldest girl, even if she's 24, kind of caring after the other ones. And I think this is more prominent in Japanese culture uh, than it would be in American culture. You see, if you watch any reality show like The Bachelorette or something, rarely do they remark on age other than to say, oh my gosh, she's so old, what is she doing on this show? Which is a complete flip. Well, that's because I think like here in America, for example, and many other countries, we operate under... Um you know, a rule of meritocracy as opposed to 
your age. So I think that in Japanese culture, maybe as you're saying, age is more of a important aspect of their culture. So older people are, people are more respected in Japan, from what I understand. And they're revered as, wow, they've made it to that age. That's incredible. We should respect them. As opposed to maybe here in the United States, we don't pay as much attention to our elders. Well, there's a couple of things here. Um, some cultures have a long history of ancestor worship and venerate their elders a lot more than Americans. I, don't, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily because they're more meritocratic or less meritocratic because... I mean, older people do tend to know a lot more because they've lived through more. doesn't mean that they may be smarter or better at doing things. And actually, this is actually an interesting bit of information, uh, which I love. People tend to assume that because you're that older adults, because they are older, are slower at doing their jobs. But the thing is that they become so much better at doing them because they find the quickest way of doing complicated jobs in the way that's easiest for them. So they generally tend to keep up with younger cohorts when it comes to actually like overall output but that's besides the point the idea of cultures that are more respectful of their elders is a fascinating one because it's difficult to see which is the correct system like what do we really honestly want what's the best for society but in america we do have a little bit of a problem in that because people are so focused on youth they never really prepare for not youth, the society turns on the idea that young people are go-getters. And we complain a lot about young people, but we expect them to be bearing the brunt of all the responsibilities of the country and to be the leaders of the country in terms of the being the next generation of ideas. Yeah, the political classes tend to be older, but after that, they kind of get shoved out of society and kind of become invisible. We don't really think about them past the point. They don't really have much input in terms of like our collective consciousness. That reminds me of an American book called The Giver. Oh, we've talked about think, The Giver. Yeah, it's one of my favorite books. I read it in high school and there, a new movie came out recently that was based on the book. I do believe we've touched this on the, on the podcast before, in fact. Yeah, and it's actually directly applicable to this episode. So maybe it's applicable to all episodes. Maybe we just keep talking about this book. No, I'm kidding. Let's rename our podcast The Giver. The Giver, yeah. I would rename it the re-giver because the giver's already out there, so we're re-giving it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Re-gifter? No, the re-gifter. <laughs> In the giver, there's an old man who has all the experiences of society, and he passes them on to this younger boy. There's two ideas here that go along with what you're saying, Luis. One is that we expect young people to kind of be the ones that are doing the work of importance in the world. So there's this young boy in the story who's basically taking on these memories from the old man, you know, and so there's that idea. And the other side is the experience of age is ultimately, ultimately important. So people think, like Ray said, that we are a meritocracy, that you earn your place, that no matter what your age, your performance is important. But then there's the importance of experience that can only be gained through age. You just can't gain enough experience without spending the time on it. And this is, there's inklings of that, this in American culture. You have Malcolm Gladwell telling us that you need to spend 10,000 hours on something to become a master at it. So there are inklings of having to spend time or travel through time to gain whatever it is you need to be a member of society that is productive and giving. Yeah, I mean, that's a very interesting point. And I think the main takeaway I want people to have from this entire episode is that aging is not something to fear necessarily. It is a part of the human experience. I think we're finding is not necessarily unavoidable from a scientific standpoint. We Science may be finding ways around that, but that's another story and we can talk about that later. In terms of what where we are right now as humans, aging is not that scary, you guys. It's fine. It happens. We've been doing it all our lives. Yeah, we've been doing it all our lives. It's just more change. It's still you. It's just you older. And the thing is, humans are amazing. We compensate for stuff really, really well. Here's some of the interesting things about getting older. One, older adults, great sex lives. 
just fantastic sex lives. Two, older adults, happier than young people. By far, they are one of the happiest cohorts. Well, that's just an interesting, you know, yeah. you would imagine like uh, younger people having exceptional sex lives versus older people. I, I would just imagine. Well, think about older people as uh, people who, one, may lose a spouse, which is very unfortunate, but that does free them up. Older men tend to be a rarity because they die younger. So women tend to get a lot more aggressive uh, in terms of seeking partners older and later in, in life. And older men tend to be a lot more of a commodity, if you will. Um, there's also the, the fact that like senior centers and places like that have a lot of community building and people find each other. And, you know, you get older, it doesn't mean that you stop having the desire to be with others. So I think adults, it increases. It increases that desire, if anything. In fact, one of one of the problems older adults were having uh, that I found was the, that I've learned is an issue in older communities is the spread of STDs. Because older right. adults have great sex lives, but not for not using protection. Which well, they kind of don't. They don't care about that, right? Because by the time any of those diseases might manifest itself, it it's like who cares? They're gonna die anyways. However, this sounds is sounds like a more a, carefree life. Well, yeah. in in part, right? it kind of is. Um, you don't have a job anymore, and you can do whatever you want. It's a chance to reinvent yourself. It's a chance to. Do new things. Did you ever want to learn how to paint? You can paint now. You're retired. Do you want to do community service? A lot of older adults, in fact, throw themselves into community service or going to church and working with their church or teaching. A lot of older adults go to teaching or doing things that help benefit their communities and themselves. They pick up new hobbies. They travel. There's a lot of stuff that you can do as an older adult. Right. So one thing I want to say about traveling, traveling as an adult is not as you, you can't be as mobile as when you're traveling as a 25 year old or a 30 year old person. And like, so that's one thing I would say people should be doing when they're young, because I hear a lot of people say, you know, I'm going to work real hard. Then I, when I retire, I'm going to be able to visit like the pyramids in Egypt and all these things and like the Amazon forest rainforest. I don't think it'll be as enjoyable as if you go now when you're younger, potentially. I, I think that you'll get more out of it. You can go zip lining safely, at least. I don't know. I just feel like when you're like 65 or 70, you might have like back problems. You don't want to put yourself at risk. So that's one thing I always like struggle with. Like, do I want to live for now or do I want to, you know, prepare myself to live in the future? I agree with you. I mean, you can't zip line, maybe. Go hang gliding in Zimbabwe or something. But Although many old people, older people do do that. Like <laughs> Richard mean, yeah. Branson is, I don't know how old he is, but he's, you know, you can stay in shape and you can make it work. But what I'm saying is, like, probability-wise, it's reduced. Right. And I, I, I agree with you on that. There, It depends on how your health is and how you've aged. You know, some people age better than others in terms of health and ability. But there are those that travel a lot more when they're older that didn't when they were young. I have a family member who never had traveled outside the United States until much later in life and now travels once or twice a year on these big trips to some amazing countries and does things that I wish I could do for sure. Uh, and my grandparents especially have traveled throughout their lives in every decade of life. Okay, so... Yeah, we've talked a lot about older people and it made us think about our own grandparents and family members who are reaching a point in their life where they are um, dealing with issues most older people deal with. Um, we talked about a lot of benefits that come out of aging and some of the negatives. And we're going to continue that conversation uh, in the next half of the episode. So listen in to our awesome commercial. Grandpa, Grandpa, I found this strange box in the attic. What is it? Well, little one, that box is a paradox box. What's a paradox box? I'm glad you asked. If you look, you'll see you've had it all along. Paradox box is a wonderful device. It allows you to have things you shouldn't have and not have at the same time. I got it from me in the future, and I'll be handing it to me in the past. 
And with it, I will and have saved the world. What are you talking about? Well, little one, you'll see. In fact, you've seen it already. Time paradox, time paradox box, you've had it all along. By Menon. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed our commercial. Uh, now we're going to continue our conversation on the topic of aging and the issues that elderly people start to face, or not even elderly people. You could talk about people. If you think about the processes of aging and the things that we go through, you know, you start off, people are basically, they're born and then they become children and then they become adolescents and they go into adulthood later adulthood middle adulthood and then you become maybe a senior citizen this is the standard way that we time travel and many people especially young people as you mentioned before Luis are afraid of getting to that older adulthood side of things but if you talk to a lot of older people and you've mentioned this too the surveys say that they're one of the happiest groups of people out there. So why why are younger people afraid of getting old? I would say that there's several factors for this. One, it's societal. We have an idea of getting old as a, t- as a time of decrepitude, a time where everything stops working and everything's awful. Your family doesn't call anymore. You're stuck in a tiny room. You're maybe a, a retired nursing home. The, the nurses are mistreating you. You're going senile. You don't know what's right or what's right from left anymore. And then on top of that, you know, you can't, you're like peeing yourself. It's bad. That's like the idea we have in our cultural consciousness of what aging is. And in fact, this is also, interestingly enough, the same reason why older adults are also very happy, or at least one of them. Because when you're an older adult and you look at yourself and you don't see that, you don't see that level of awfulness. You think, oh, man, I'm doing great, as opposed to teenagers who have the opposite problem, where they're expected to be glamorous models by TV, and then they look at themselves and they're like, oh, no, my life is awful. I'm doing terribly. So it's this weird, like, social dynamic that is really screwy. So what you're saying, basically, is that the expectations for teenagers are just much higher than the expectations of life for an older person so that we are just comparing ourselves to the social norm and it's much easier to be aligned with the social norm of being an old person as compared to the social norm of being a successful pop star teenager. Yes, although I would say that that's not to say that there isn't truth to the problems that people I imagine with older adults. Older adults do often face isolation I think it's like 30% of them are below the poverty line. There's a lot of problems that older adults face, The least one of which is obviously their health. Your health does get worse over time. You face the loss of your spouse if you have one. There are a lot of problems that obviously come with getting older. The thing is, older adults tend to be very, have very rich emotional lives. They are very, they have a lot of emotional intelligence, which allows them to cope much better with a lot of these problems than most other people would in the same situation if they weren't also, if they hadn't also aged into it. If a 15 year old loses the ability to walk, I can bet you they're going to be a lot more depressed than an equivalent person who has lived a long life. Losing use of your legs is awful across your entire life. That would be an awful event for anyone. But older adults tend to have coping mechanisms that teenagers and younger adults may not necessarily have. Have any of you ever thought about what that could be like, right? What would you do when you're done with work? What would you do? What would you spend your time on? Even if, let's say, you're limited by mobility or hearing or one of these other things, you're not necessarily locked in a chair, unable to move forever, at least not for a long time. You have to be generally pretty infirm and relatively relatively old for that to be the case. So you have a pretty chunk of good, healthy, older adult years for the most part. What are you going to do? What would you like to do when you retire? What are some of the fun things you'd do? So I think I'd gather some some of my friends or neighbors, whoever's in my community, and probably start a podcast and just talk about the adventures of my life. This 
this is helpful in two ways. One, um, I'm socially connecting with new people. I'm actually engaging the community. I'm having people listen to me. So that's engaging. And two, it's also helping me recollect my own memories and strengthen um, my history and make it more concrete to myself. So I'm in improving my life and I think the people around me in that way. This may seem very meta, but I agree with you, Ray. Old people could podcast and create content in general. Older adults on TV, writing, sharing poetry, all of these creative endeavors, because they have so much life experience, they have so much to draw on that's very interesting, very informative, entertaining, emotional. They have so much more to share. I feel like content becomes less and less superficial from people who have lived a, a long and deep life. So I wonder if there's a way to encourage people post-retirement uh, to do those things. I think that usually they think of writing memoirs, and that's the popular solution that's portrayed in media, that somebody retires and they write a memoir. But they really could do other things like podcasting and, and live videos, and uh, if they can manage the technology. So one thing about running a podcast, it's quite challenging, I would imagine, for some people who haven't had any kind of recording or audio or digital experience uh, with tech, you know, technologies. Sure, if the person was a, in a band in their previous life or they had some experience recording audio or editing audio, it might be easy for them. But I think developing a platform that makes things easier for people to make that kind of content and editing easier that could be beneficial. Um, not only podcast, though, that's kind of limiting. It's only audio, but maybe they would like to act. Maybe they want to, like, they have a stage up on screen. You know, that's kind of cool. They, a lot of older people dance. A lot of older people um, find book clubs. There's lots of things to do. Plenty of people have hit success only late in age and in terms of, well, new, in new ventures, right? Acting or singing or well, maybe not singing, but but actually, even singing, music, there's a lot of people who have found a passion they did not know was there later in life. But I will say I am deeply hurt that both of you decided that you will have a podcast and not PFL when you are retired. So apparently this podcast is not going to last I thought we were years. going to have PFL I'm so hurt. in 40 years. Aren't we having PFL in 40 years? Or are you competing with us? What's happening? I was just thinking we can maintain it up to that point. Yeah, I agree. We'll have, uh, hopefully by that time, we'll have our system up and running. <laughs> <laughs> so here's an interesting um, factoid about aging. So one of the things that's very sad about getting older that is very distressing for most people, it's the loss of a spouse. And this is indeed, you know, a, ter a terrible event for most humans. It can be deeply traumatic. M people tend to, their, their lives are turned upside down when they lose a spouse in old, in old age, or at any time, really. But interestingly enough, people who never get married, who never find a spouse, who are single for life, tend to do really well in old age because they have really strong social circles. I've heard that actually if you do not have a spouse or if you never, you're never you single your whole life, I think that's that hurts your ability to live as long i heard i heard married people live longer isn't that the case yeah um i think because you with, have a lot of support emotional support somebody very intimately close to you to a point <clears throat> the somewhat sad truth about that is that yes people who are married tend to be very happy together and have a great time and it's all wonderful but the problem is when's your when your spouse dies especially if you're a man at least research has shown that your health tends to decline very rapidly. Men tend to have very small social circles and their main person in their lives that is like a, the person they actually confide in is their spouse. Yeah, and right? this is across the board because yeah. you have in any age, w women tend to socialize or have a, a circle of friends and men don't tend to have close friends. So they might go to social events, but they have a smaller circle of friends. Or and even if they have friends, they tend to be less forthcoming with emotions and right. they, they tend to be more closed off. So they tend to put all that on their wife if, 
you know, if that's what they have. So they outsource emotion to their spouse. Got yeah, it. while women tend to have, uh, again, this is all based on population research and whatnot. I'm not saying anything about anyone specific. Um, but in general, women tend to have social circles that allow them to actually have emotional support outside the house. When a spouse dies, men tend to decline and pass away very shortly afterwards. Not the least of which because men tend to live shorter lives anyways. But on top of that, the added stress of losing your main support system. And not to mention for older people, for older generations, a lot of the time, the spouse was also the person that cooked and did all the other things. Right? If when it's with, uh, in terms of, you know, women, the wives tend to do all that. So you lose, men tend to lose a lot when this happens and their mental stage and physical stage tends to decline very rapidly shortly after. And oftentimes they pass away within a year of their spouse dying. Women hang around a lot longer for the most part, but people who are single for life don't have to deal with that. So that's something. Right. But they might not ever get that emotional connection. I mean, you don't necessarily need to get married to have a emotional connections as strong as a couple who are married. You can have multiple very strong connections with the opposite sex or the same sex or whatever you want yeah. um, throughout your life. And as you're saying, grow your network even broader and be able to lean on people. Sounds like the lesson is that as you age, no matter if you're 12 aging to 20 or 20 aging to 50 or and onward, that having friends is one of the most critical, yeah. being social and having people, not at an acquaintance level, not at like, I see them at bingo level, but having people to emotionally rely on, that rely on you and that you rely on to have some connection of need between each other and intimacy with people around us is necessary to age well. I would agree with that. Um, and... It's not. It's it's about avoiding isolation. Isolation is one of the worst things that can happen to an older adult. Uh, it, just being at home, not being able to go anywhere or see anyone, and just giving up because a lot of your friends have passed away, and that happens. Your friends pass away, and if you don't have a family, that can be very distressing. Or if you have a family but they're they don't live nearby, which happens a lot in the U.S. Right? Families tend to be spread all over the country. It can be really sad and it can be very difficult. And lacking a positive attitude can have a really big impact on your ability to live a long life, a long, healthy life at least. I wanted to point out that you mentioned a difference that is very key. You said aging from 12 to 20 or aging from 25 to 50. But the thing is, we don't call 12 to 20 aging, we call it growth. True. Okay. You're developing. I see it differently. You don't, until you're 25 around there, you're still developing. Your body's not at its mature, uh, like its most mature. And that, when you hit that point, it's technically, physiologically, mm, all decline from there. Which is not the most positive thing in the world, but it's just how biology works, at least until t technology fixes that. It's so interesting that you bring this up because recently I was reading about senescence and how biological aging is basically a deterioration that has to do with when cells stop dividing and also kind of the debris that passes along cells. So at a cellular functioning level, aging begins at some point, which is really interesting. So it's, you're right, we're traveling through time from age zero to whenever we pass away but we're not aging until we hit a certain point of biological cellular functioning. So I'm about to bring up my favorite thing ever. <laughs> um, I, I'm sure I've told you guys before, but I haven't said it on the podcast. If I had a spirit animal, or not a spirit animal, if I had a sigil for my, if I ever like made a house sigil, I would have, and I had like a, like the house animal, it would be an immortal jellyfish. Now you may be asking, what's an immortal jellyfish, Luis? I'll tell you, I found out about this thing when I was in high school, and ever since, I've loved it. Which, by the way, you have mentioned in another episode. Oh. So this is how much you love this jellyfish. You're right, I did mention that before. Um, but the Emerald Jellyfish, if for the listeners who may not have heard it before, is a jellyfish that has the ability to go from 
uh, being a polyp, which is essentially, think about it like a baby, right? It's like the infant stage of jellyfish. And then when it becomes sexually mature, becomes an actual uh, jellyfish, when you consider a jellyfish, it has the ability to return to being a polyp at any time. So it can do this ad infinitum until it's killed, starves, or gets sick. And so it means that it is able to escape the cycle of aging. It doesn't age to death. Because no one dies from old age, everyone dies from some condition brought on by old age, whether it's heart failure or some other body system failing. And this jellyfish shows us that aging's not a part of nature that needs to be. It is not required for systems to exist. It is not required for biological life to exist, which asks, which was something that blew my mind as a teenager because I'd always just assumed everyone aged and like, that was it. You just aged because that's how the way the world was and you never questioned it. So now I'm much more open to the idea that maybe there's something we can do to f basically stop the aging process. And that's something that's going to be interesting. And I may never live to see that day, but I think it's going to be an interesting world if that ever comes to be. Whether it's going to be a dystopia, utopia, or something in between, who knows? So, yeah, I mean, there are companies working on ways to give you your biological age as opposed to, you know, the number of years you've lived according to the domain of time that society chooses. Biological age checks your length of your telomeres, and telomeres basically um, are part of your cell, and within your uh, DNA, telomeres help to make sure that if there are any kind of errors in replication of your DNA, when that happens, when your cells replicate, every time there is a replication, your telomere kind of acts as like the plastic part of your shoelace that makes sure that it doesn't get threaded away. So, you know, the tip of your shoelaces have these plastic um, protection areas. That's what a telomere is. So over time, those plastic covers kind of get worn down and then eventually the fabric gets worn down and then your entire shoelace gets destroyed. So telomeres are one way that we're measuring and trying to improve aging. So there are companies trying to sell you supplements that help to lengthen your telomere or prevent shortening of your telomere and helps to decrease your biological age. It's such a weird and awful exchange, the way that these telomeres work. Because the telomeres are actually a safety mechanism. They're there to prevent cancer, really. If your cells, what, because what is cancer? Cancer is a cell that is dividing and multiplying with no end. It doesn't have a biological end to it, so it just keeps multiplying. It's immortal, basically. It's an immortal cell. So it just it grows, 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 expands, 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 more, more, more cells, more cells, more cells, and then eventually becomes a tumor and it kills you. Telomeres stop that by preventing the, the, that infinite division, or at least the way that cells are made by having that limit to the divisions that you can have, you essentially halt the ability for, your, for the cells to develop cancer. And it's only when these systems that are there in place to make sure that cells can only divide a certain amount of time break down that then you have cancer. Right, and also to add to that, without having like your apoptosis program to destroy the older cells and to kill them and to re re you know use that use those components for new cells and things like that you get this reproduction of multiple immortal cells cancer basically exactly so then the weird thing is many of the re much of the research in trying to undo this safety mechanism to expand our lives, we also run the risk of shortening them. So it's 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 this research has to be done with a lot of care. And it's gonna be very interesting to see where it goes, especially now that we have CRISPR that allows us to really do a lot in terms of the way we can change geno like our genetic code and the way that our bodies work and the way that children are born and the way that they look and everything about them. It's gonna be interesting to see whether that changes the way that this re the direction this research is going. And I think it's going to be fascinating. We live in, an, in a brave new world. Right, but just thinking about CRISPR, a lot of CRISPR is quite targeted, but it's not perfectly targeted yet. So there's lots of issues with CRISPR. So I don't want people to think that it's going to be the one thing to revolutionize aging. And you know, there's still a lot to get through th this new technology. 
what's interesting to me is that we're looking into so many of these ways to extend our lives, but we're unwilling to eat less or eat in moderation or stay out of ultraviolet ray exposure with the sun. Simple ways to extend our lives that are natural. And it's almost like we want to eat our cake, have our cake and eat it too. Is that the phrase? Where we want to be able to do all the bad things. This goes back to the guilty pleasures episode. We want to be able to do all those bad things and yet find a way to not have to experience the effects, the consequences. It's so easy to extend our lives by exercising and eating well and staying out of, you know, extreme sun exposure and such. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we've talked a a little bit about aging, some of the biological, emotional issues, you know, comparing it to younger people. But really, this is a big topic. And we've only touched upon a few of the aspects of aging. And I think that as technology gets better, we're going to have more and more conversations about aging and memories and death and how people will, you know, see these topics and how we'll be communicating them amongst each other as human beings. So with that, I'd like to thank our listeners and invite them to once again, follow us on Twitter at the PFL podcast and check out our website, pflpodcast.com and definitely, definitely follow us on SoundCloud. And I hope you've enjoyed this episode. We like to just say one more thing. Stay crazy. Stay crazy.